All right, 1 Kings chapter 19. This is probably, I think it's the last chapter that we're going to see just kind of dedicated to Elijah and, and, his, and just completely dedicated to him. Next chapters we'll be getting into back with Ahab and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, and they're fighting and going back and forth and stuff like that. But um, let's, uh, let's dive right in here. So if you remember last week, chapter 18 was that, that great story about um, Elijah set up this challenge basically to determine who is God. And they had the, you know, all the, the prophets of Baal came and, and they, had, they had their offering and they had to just see if, if Baal would, would answer by fire and consume their offering for them. And then, of course, obviously nothing happened. They were cutting themselves. They were jumping up and down. They were yelling out. They were doing all their, all their things. And, and it didn't work because Baal is a false god. And then Elijah got up there, prepared the evening sacrifice, and, uh, of course, you know, dumped all the water over it and did everything he did. And then at the end of that, he, um, you know, commanded that. He's just like, hey, you know, take these prophets now because the people all saw, like, well, the Lord, he is the God, right? The Lord, he is the God. That's what they said. And he said, you know, take these prophets and, and kill them. And, and he killed them by the, by the brook Kydron, I believe. So, um, that's where we left off there. And then, oh, and then, of course, he prayed for the rain, right? Because there had been that, that great drought, and he prayed, and God sent the rain, and then he ran uh, back and, and went ahead of Ahab. So here we're picking up now in chapter 19, and Ahab now tells his wife, he goes and tells Jezebel, all that Elijah had done, verse 1, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And we see here, you notice how, um, it's kind of interesting just that how Ahab, he was there when all this stuff happened, and he didn't do anything to stop it, right? He didn't do anything to stop the prophets of Baal being murdered. But then he goes home and tells his wife about it, and his wife gets really angry, and he's like, she, and you can see how she's kind of running the show here, but you know, Ahab's not the one in charge at his home by any means. And she sends a messenger to Elijah saying that basically you're, you know, you're going to be killed just like those prophets were killed. And he gets this threat. So um, and right after this great victory, right? I mean, it seems like all the people are behind him now finally, and, and he has this great victory, and then he destroys these prophets of Baal. And... Um, and now he's getting his life threatened. So verse number three says, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And we see here, and this is something, this is a really important point and kind of a theme for this chapter of what happens to Elijah and just, he goes into this depression. He has this great victory, right? I mean, he's, he's being steadfast. He's standing for God. He's doing all this stuff. He's got everyone against him seemingly. I mean, he continues to say like, I'm the only one standing for you, Lord, right? And he's the one doing this. But he has this awesome event where, where God answers him. He hears him and everybody sees it, you know, and, and the people there where he's like, you know, you got to make a decision. What are you going to do? You know, people and everyone was just quiet about it until God answers by fire. And then everyone's like, well, the Lord, yeah, he's the God. And they're all jumping on the Elijah bandwagon with serving the Lord, right? I mean, that's what it seems like. That's what, that's what happens here. To the point to where he's, he's able to command for the, the prophets of Baal that in, in just prior to that event, I'm sure had a lot of clout. They had a lot of esteem among the people being these prophets, right? That, that now he's saying, we'll have them killed. And everyone's like, yeah, let's have them killed. You know, no one did anything to prevent it. No one did anything against Elijah. He was there under the power of God. I mean, and it's literally this huge victory. Now, we have to be careful in our own lives when you have great victories, when you have great triumphs, when everything is going good. I mean, just so I was talking about, you know, they've got these over a thousand souls being saved in Malawi and, you know, and, and all these people, whatever it is that's doing good, you're doing a great work for God and you're just getting this victory. Watch out for the attack because that seems to be, like we don't want to get too caught up in this and then get so brought so far down low because of persecution because an attack comes, you know, 
Elijah just goes from this extreme of having this great victory now to being to the point to where he wants to die. And we see a little bit in his heart here. And, and one of the things I want to point out is how he isolates himself. As soon as he gets this bad news, he starts to run. He flees for his life. Now, I don't think he had to worry for his life, but he did it. You know, I mean, he, he ran away, which, whatever, I'm not going to condemn him for, for, running, for running away. Obviously, he should be just be doing what the Lord tells him to do, but, I mean, he's, if he's trying to be a little bit wise and just go, I'll say, well, I'm not going to hang out here anymore, he goes to Judah. But once he gets to, um, you know, to Beersheba, technically in Judah, once he gets to Beersheba, he leaves, he could have just hung out there, but he leaves his servant there, so the guy that's been with him this whole time, he's been serving him. And then he goes out into the wilderness. He just goes off by himself. And I'll tell you what, when, and you can take this out, whether you're, it's following a great victory or not, when you get this, this persecution or you go through a low point, you know, hopefully it's not someone trying to kill you like it was with Elijah, but whatever, whatever the circumstances, whatever the persecution, the last thing you want to do is just go and isolate yourself. That is not a good choice to do and just, and just kind of hole up and not let anyone be around you because that's going to continue your, your depression, the, your, you know, their state of mind. It's a lot harder to get out of that state, that frame of mind all by yourself than if you have other people there to help encourage you and edify you and build you back up again. But see, Elijah got to this place in his mind where he just felt completely alone. He thought, there's nobody that's with me. There's no one that understands me. And he had gotten to this point even before the whole thing happened with, the, you know, with offering up the sacrifices. And there's a lot of things to learn from this chapter because dealing with depression and dealing with being down like this to the point where you want to die is common. I mean, it's more common than I think that people realize. A lot of people go through this type of event in their life and they just feel really depressed and sad and unfortunately what happens it's almost like a natural tendency people want to break off and just be by themselves but over and over and over again you are gonna see that's not going to help at all you need to have support from other people you need other people around see Elijah leaves his servant there and he went off by himself so it says he went off into the wilderness sat down under a tree and he's just God just kill me now and, and you, could, you could tell how depressed he is because he just had this great victory. He's saying, you know what? I'm not even better than my father's. God, just, just, just kill me. Just end it now. Uh, you know, basically, he's, he's, he's just chalking up like I'm a, I'm a failure. My life's good for nothing anymore. And depression and isolation do not go hand in hand. I mean, unfortunately, they do go hand in hand, but these, this is a, it's, a, it's a bad formula for if you want to try to, to fix the state of mind and being depressed. You don't want to go off and isolate yourself. Amen. Now, he told his servant to stay behind, and he did. So there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of things that we're going to learn from this chapter. One is if you are feeling depressed, if you're feeling really down, if you think, you know, whatever is going on in your life, you, don't, you, you need to remember that the solution is not going to be to go off and isolate yourself. That is not going to help at all. We need to remember that we're not alone. I'm going to get to that a little bit, but Elijah wasn't alone. He felt very alone. God tells him that there were 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. He tells him that. And he also just had those other people. He heard from um, Obadiah, right, what things he had done. Now, he wasn't the best, ex you know, the best shining example of a Christian, but he knew that he, was, he, he worshiped the Lord, and he was doing some things, you know, to, uh, on his own, in his own way to, to help out. And he did kind of put his neck out there a little bit trying to save these other prophets. So, I mean, he, instead of Elijah taking a little bit more comfort in that, like he could have. He could have realized, well, I'm not, it's not all by myself. You know, Obadiah definitely had his shortcomings. We went over that before of what he should have done. But now taking it from the other perspective, when Elijah's getting into this depressed state of just thinking like, man, I, don't, I can, can't deal with this stuff. He went through a lot, no doubt. He had a lot of stress and a lot of, a lot of 
turmoil. I mean, he was out and hiding for a long time. He's out by the brook. He's got ravens feeding him. He goes into this poor widow woman's house. That's, that's also feeding him. They've got nothing, but God's providing for him, right? But still difficult situations, right? I mean, it's not, he had the faith and praise God for that, but we can look at that and, and, and kind of think that he's a superhuman. And we got to realize he's still, I mean, imagine just going through that day in and day out. It, it's going to get to you a little bit. Right. I mean, just naturally, it's going to get to you. We'd like to think that you're impervious to any outside factors and, and hunger or anything else that's going on and, and, and to think that I don't care if nobody likes me. But that stuff will wear down on you after a while. Yeah. And it happens. And we need to remember that. And, and yeah, be strong. Yeah, be the example. Be, be a rock. Be solid. But be wise in the sense that okay, I don't want to just go off and isolate myself just to show how strong I am or whatever because if you're starting to get depressed, that's not going to help you. And that didn't help Elijah going off by himself. He left that servant there. Now, from the servant's perspective too, he told the servant to stay behind and he did. He did you know, he's, he's there helping him, ministering to him. But sometimes when people tell you they're fine, they're really not. And there are going to be times, and it may be a little bit harder to discern, you need to use some discernment with this, but there's going to be some times when it's, not, it's best not to leave people all alone. And we get a good contrast with this servant and what Elisha does. Now, keep your finger here and turn, if you would, just a few pages to the right to 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to see, because Elijah calls Elisha then to be his servant and minister to him. It's interesting how his current servant, we don't know anything about him except for really this one verse that he said he left his servant there. He had a servant. He had a servant with him that was traveling with him. And what you're going to find in the Bible is that all of the great leaders were servants at one time. And they, 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 led, they, they followed someone else. Joshua was the servant that, to Moses and he ministered to Moses and helped Moses up until the point when it was time for him to take over the reins and then become that great leader. We see Elisha was Elijah's servant. He ministered unto Elijah. He did whatever it was Elijah needed and, and was humble and took direction and did whatever he needed to do until finally Elijah was taken to heaven. Now Elisha stepped in his place and, and continued to lead and do the, do the work of the Lord. And you're going to see that those aren't the only two examples. There's many others like that of people who are, are being humbled or in a servant's position before they become a leader. And those are always the best leaders that are the, the most humble and take, take the... Um, and are able to just be a servant, a minister. 2 Kings chapter 2, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. So now he's telling Elisha, saying, Look, you just wait here. This is his servant. Again, a similar situation. But in this situation, Elijah's going off because he's gonna, God's going to take him to heaven by a whirlwind. And Elijah knew this. And other people knew this. And he's telling Elisha, Elisha, just stay right here. Just stay here. I'm going to go off by myself. I think Elijah had that about him. That is kind of an attitude of just being, you know, just being able to do everything on his own. Right? And we've got to be careful. It's not a bad attitude to have. We've got to be careful that you don't get too prideful. And I'm not saying Elijah was a proud man, but he didn't seem to want to, to have helpers with him very much. He seemed to be a loner and just kind of wanting to do everything on his own. But look at what Elisha says. It says, And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And this happened like three times. He said, Okay, well, we're here. You just, God's calling me over here. Just stay here. Just, just hang back here. Elisha would not leave. He said, No, I'm, I am your you know, servant. I'm your minister. I'm going to stay at your side. Whatever it is that God has for you, I'm going to be there with you. And that's the type of servant that Elisha was as opposed to this other servant that when Elijah said, you just stay here, I'm going off in the wilderness by myself, right? After someone searches for their life, he should have been like, no, I'm coming with you. And we need to take that to heart. There's a lot of people, and there's people that we even know, people in this church that, that don't want to accept help from people. And sometimes we need to be able to recognize boundaries, but at the same time provide help when people really need help and be there for them and strengthen them during their low points so that 
They're not just completely isolating themselves and getting to a point to where they just want to die. And so Elijah said out loud, he's saying, Lord, just kill me. Just take my life. God didn't want Elijah to die. He could have killed him. But he said no. He had a lot more. There's a lot more work that Elijah still does in his life after this. There's still more things that God uses him for. But this is the point that he got to, and it's a very serious point. Go back if you would to 1 Kings chapter 19. And we're going to see some other indications, some other things that happen when people get this depressed. One, they want to isolate themselves. They want to be away from everybody else. Look at verse number 5. It says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. When people get depressed, especially when you want to you know, get to the point where you're ready to die, they oftentimes sleep a lot. So you don't want to do anything. You get real depressed. You don't want to do anything. You're not motivated to do anything. And we see here Elijah's doing that very thing. He's sleeping under the tree and he's to the point now where he's not even like wanting to take care of himself as far as eating goes. I mean, this angel of the Lord comes like, hey, here's some food and some water. You know, you know drink this. He wakes up. Okay, he sees the food. It's all there for him. So he eats it and then he goes back to sleep again. This is some wisdom that we don't want to overlook in the Bible. These are signs of, of things that we need to be watching out for with our loved ones. Okay, when people start to have bad things going on and they start to sleep all the time and want to isolate themselves and not really taking care of themselves, they need help. Elijah needs help. Elijah needs someone to help bring him up and edify him and, 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 and stir him up and, and get him to realize that he has a lot more value than he thinks he has, that he is better than his father's that he is doing a great work for God, that he is doing things that really matter and it's just that wicked witch Jezebel that's against him because she works for Satan. Right. And it's not that everybody's against him. He's doing a great work and it's, you can't let the one person get to you, whoever that is, that's, that's, that's bringing you down to that, pay, that place. Whatever it is, everyone's going to have different situations. But he needs someone to, to help him through that. Job got to the place where he needed people. That Job wanted to die too. Understandably so with everything that he lost and everything he went through. But it's just another example of someone that needed. And, and what did his friends do? Instead of helping him and encouraging him and, and, and you know, being empathetic towards him, they're saying, oh, what sin did you do, Job? What did you, you, know, you must have done something really bad for God to come down on you like this. That's not what a friend needs when they're going through the worst time of their life, of you telling them, you know, fess up, man, what did you do? Because God doesn't do this to people who are righteous. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, but Satan does. So we see here, we see um, Elijah going off. Oh, as far as the, the other servant, the other... The other um, example that comes to mind, you know, Elisha was this good servant that wouldn't leave Elijah. He said, no, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be there. Think about Ruth, right? Naomi lost her husband. She lost her sons. All that was left was her daughters-in-law. And she told him, hey, stay here. This is your land. I'm going to go back. But what did Ruth say? She said, no, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to worry. I'm going to help provide for you because you lost everything. And she did the right thing and, and you know, thought of others, esteemed others better than themselves and helped Naomi out. Naomi could have gotten extremely depressed just being off by her own, everyone being dead in her family. But Ruth was faithful and stuck with her and helped her out and, and worked to bring home some food and really took care of her. Those are the examples, the Elishas and the Ruths that we need to look to as examples of who we should be when people are going through these hard times and how we need to think above ourselves and say, no, this person needs, needs me right now. This person needs some help. Especially when you've got other things going on in your life. I mean, I, we don't know exactly how old she was, but from the sounds of it, Ruth wasn't that old. She was definitely young enough to have found another man, started a life, you know, married, kids, whatever, right? 
and doing that whole thing. And she just said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. She sacrificed of herself to help someone else out. Elijah was in need of a, of a servant here that was going to be there and help him. A friend. Not just a servant, but a friend. Someone who's going to stick with him. A lot of people, we all need friends. I don't care who you are. And we need to never also underestimate the importance of coming to church. There's a lot of people that will watch church online and sometimes they'll feel like they have this connection with that church right so they're isolated but they're watching and they're thinking like oh yeah you you feel this kind of a false connection of like as if you're really there because of the technology and watching the videos and stuff but think about this it's not real because you're not actually here but what if everyone had that attitude of just like well i'm just i'm not going to come in i'm just going to watch at home just going to sit at home today and just, and just watch. What if everyone decided to do that and I'm here with nobody else in this auditorium because everyone decides, well, I'm just going to watch church from home. Do you think that's going to be edifying for me? I mean, you feel like, oh yeah, it's like I'm there, you know, everything's going on. Well, what about other people? You know, when you're not here, and this is why, as of right now, unless I change my mind, I don't think I will. We're never going to stream our entire service ever. I don't want people to get comfortable with the fact of just thinking that like, just substituting online church for actually being here. Because the import it's so important to be in church for many reasons. Many reasons. And it's not just about me, okay? It's about you. Every time there's people missing here, I'm wondering... How are they doing? I hope everything's okay. Where are they at? You know, the, it, every single time someone comes in and people who don't even come really regularly, that's encouraging. And I'm sure it's not just for me. Other people are like, hey, how you doing? You know, how are things going? It's always an encouragement for the entire church when you are here. You individually. I'm speaking to every single one of you here tonight. It is an encouragement for everybody else when you are here. You matter to everyone in this church. Or definitely to me. Can't speak for everybody individually, but I know for me, every single person in this church matters to me. And when you're here, it matters to me. And it encourages me, and it helps me out a lot. And I try to be here for you as much as I can to help you out. And that's what church is about. That's what this church is about. This congregation. We care about you and want you to be edified as much as we are individually just by being here and coming and, and having the fellowship and not being isolated but being a part and around other people that will be able that, that hey they're like minded we believe in the Lord too because when you're off by yourself you might feel like Elijah and think I'm the only one left everyone around me is nuts they all think and is repent of your sins or crazy charismatic stuff or, or I could lose myself whatever all this stuff I feel like I'm the only one that believes this, this way and you feel isolated. And it, it, it really wears on you. That's why people are moving across the country to go to churches because they feel like I'm all alone. And for good reason. Because they, they at least recognize this is important. I need to get plugged into a good church. There's a lot of value to that. I don't want to end up like Elijah did here wanting just to die. And we ought not to. We ought, we ought to, to, I mean, obviously try to stay upbeat, try to stay focused, but get yourself around people. Make some good friends too. Yeah. Come to church and get to know other people. Get to make friends with people in church. That you can have people there to help you out and to be there for you. It makes a big difference. But here we see, finally, with this example of Elijah, that even if there was no one else that, that Elijah, Elijah didn't have a good friend, he didn't have anyone at this point in his life that was able to, to kind of help him out, God loved him. That's right. God was there for him. God sent an angel to help him out. And God loves you too. And we need to remember that and not think that that you know, you're all alone.
Because even if every other man, woman, fails you, God will never fail you. Amen. He's always there. And this is the good example that we had with Elijah. So he's, let's, let's go back into this uh, chapter here, chapter 19. Verse, uh, so he's told to rise and eat. He gets up, he eats. Uh, in verse 6, and then in verse 7, it says, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. So now he's being told, You've got a journey ahead of you. You need to get strengthened. So get up and eat. We've got, uh, we've got some more food for you. And um, you're going you're gonna to go on this journey. Your journey's not over yet. I know you feel like it is, but there's more, more work for you to do. Verse 8, And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Now, even at this low point, God still, he gives them what he needs. And we need to recognize this too. He gives them what he needs. He doesn't give him everything he wants necessarily because think about it, he just had two meals and he's like, well, it's a long journey. Imagine going somewhere for like that's going to take you 40 days and 40 nights to get to your destination by walking or what, you know, whatever means that he did. I don't think he even rode an animal, but I mean, we don't know that for sure. It doesn't say, but for, I mean, just by car. <laughs> okay. For 40 days, you had two meals. God gave him enough, but that's what he had and what he needed to get to that point. I've never gone 40 days and 40 nights without eating. Never once. I don't want to. To <laughs> be honest with you, I don't want to do a fast like that. That's got to be extremely difficult and challenging. But you know what? God gave him what he needed. Even when he was really sad and depressed, he didn't just like say, okay, Elijah, here, I'm going to give you all this phony stuff that's going to make you happy for a short period of time, all this money and wealth and whatever. Because people who try to satisfy or, or combat their depression with physical things, just mo you know, monetary stuff, money, goods, it's all empty and you're going to find out that it's empty. It's not really going to solve the problem. And yes, it's more difficult going through the hard journey. Elijah went through this difficult journey. And in the end, we're going to see he meets God. He has a conversation with God at the end of this journey. The journey, I guarantee, look, it's, it's, it's one verse. You can read over that so fast. 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, yeah, let's keep going. 40 days and 40 nights on a journey having just had those two meals and, and, and feeling like he wants to die, and now, okay, i got to trudge through this. But he comes out so much stronger at the end and, and really gets what he needs and not some, some shallow or vain solution to his problem. And anyone who's dealing with depression or, or hard times, you're going to have to go through a journey, and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. But... You don't want to just grab at the, at the easy way out or, or the thing that's just going to give you temporary happiness. You need to get through that journey in order to come out better in the end and to get what's best for you. Sometimes, you know, usually, oftentimes, what, what's best for people is not, it's not the easy thing to do. It's going to be the hard time. But knowing that ahead, having that in your, in your mind, and knowing, okay, I'm going to go through this. It's not going to be easy. It might be really difficult. It might be as difficult as going 40 days and 40 nights without any food and going on this long journey. But at the end, it's going to be worth it. You need to keep that mindset to get through to the end and, and work through the problems that you're having. What's really interesting here, though, is it, it calls Mount Horb is, is his destination place. And I thought this was pretty cool because I, I did some research into this and I didn't realize uh, prior to studying for this sermon um, how significant Horeb is. Um, turn if you, keep your finger here. Turn if you would to Exodus chapter 3. And what also seems to be, it's pretty fascinating to me how God has specific places 
in the Bible that just come up over and over and over again. I mean, there, there are definitely places that God is, is, his presence is known more than in others. And it's just like the same place over and over and over again. Horeb is one of those places. It's called the Mount of God in this chapter because of another event that happened earlier with Moses. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible reads, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And of course, it goes on and on, and this is the, the burning bush. This is where God appears unto Moses as his burning bush, and he has a conversation with God at Mount Horeb. It's also the place where Moses received the Ten Commandments. So remember, he got the burning. He talks to God in the burning bush. He goes back into Egypt as, to be this great deliverer of his people. And then after they come back out of Egypt, and he's leading them through the wilderness and anything, when God gives him the Ten Commandments, guess where he goes back to? The Horeb. The Deut turn if you were to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10. I just want you to see this here. Deuteronomy 4, 10. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Deuteronomy 4, 11. And ye came near and stood under the mountain. And the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you, Out of the midst of the fire ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that ye might do them in the land, whither ye go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. So we see again God speaking to Moses out of the fire in, mount, in the mountain at Horeb. And from this, because this is in Deuteronomy 4, in Exodus 19 is another, uh, is a parallel passage with Deuteronomy, with Deuteronomy, but basically Exodus and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. So in Exodus, we see the law given. Deuteronomy is the, is the second time. It kind of goes through a lot of the same stuff. That Mount Horeb is also known as Mount Sinai. So you just think about in your, in your mind all the significance of Mount Sinai and, and all the th events that happened. In, uh, and I'll just, you don't have to turn there. You could turn back to 1 Kings 19 if you'd like. But in Exodus 19, right before the Ten Commandments are given, in verse 16, the Bible says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount, and Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And you could read on and on in chapters 19 and 20. That is when he received the Ten Commandments. It's in the same place. So that is saying he's at Mount Sinai and in these other places it's talking about Horeb. Now, Mount Sinai might be like the actual name of the mountain, Horeb, the, the name of the region. Doesn't matter. It's the same place. So it's the same mountain. It's talking about the mountain of God. Why is it called the mountain of God? Because God appeared to Moses multiple times. He appeared to him in that burning bush at the same mount that he received the Ten Commandments, at the same mount now that Elijah is being told to go to to meet with God, where God is going to speak to him there. Places in the Bible carry significance. and I, To me, it's extremely interesting to see how God appears in specific places. We see with the, in, with the, the, at the Mount of Olives, too, I believe that's where Jesus Christ is going to come back when he returns and, uh, and sets up his kingdom. That, is, that as you saw him leaving, they said, so shall you see him return. And because places have so much significance and, and this, you know, events happen over and over again in, in particular places, 
You know, it's another one of those things where I think that's exactly where it's going to happen. And um, for whatever reason, I, I don't know all the reasons why God picks certain places to do things, but he does. And to me, it's just kind of interesting to see that little uh, connection there. Horeb and Mount Sinai. So remember that when you do your regular reading, uh, keep that in mind because I'm sure you'll probably learn something more as a result. Of that. And like I said, this is something that, I, that just got connected for me. So whatever further truth there is to learning from that, I'm still going to be studying that out. But um, I wanted to point that out because it was pretty interesting. So let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 19. Verse number 9. The Bible says, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And um, I don't know. To me, this is just, I don't think it's just semantics, but it says the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, who is he? The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? Um, I think that's a, a meeting of Jesus there in the Old Testament here with Elijah. So he says, what are you doing here? Verse number 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Now again, that word jealousy, I'm not going into this very much. Jealous is not a bad thing. This, this society and the way that it's defined now is a little bit different, but jealousy is not a bad thing. He was jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Why was he jealous for the Lord God of hosts? Because people were going off and worshiping all these other gods. And he said, you're the true God. I'm jealous because there's people just defiling your name and, and, and going after false gods and everything else. You're the one that deserves all the worship, Lord. So I'm jealous for you. The same way that a jealous husband doesn't want anyone else looking at a wife because he belongs to you. I don't want, I don't want everyone else, you know, looking on the same way that I do, the someone that, that belongs to me, right? You're jealous over your wife or your husband. Well, God is jealous over his people. The Bible says that God is a jealous God. And Elijah is jealous for his God. Saying they shouldn't be going a whoring around with other gods, a term that the Bible uses frequently, when people are going whoring after their idols and their false gods. They need to stay true to the one true God. So that's why he's jealous. But he keeps on reading verse number 10. And, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. Look at this. And they seek my life to take it away. So again, he says, I'm the only one left. Remember, he's, still, I mean, he's depressed. He was, he was just wanting to die. But he goes on this long journey. What are you doing here, Elijah? Well, I'm jealous for you, but everyone's forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. You know, they killed the prophets, and I'm just the only one left. But it's just like, he didn't even give it any time after that great event to see who was going to be with him. You know, yeah, all those things had happened, but he just had that great victory, right? And the last thing I want you to notice there is that, that where he says, they seek my life. No, Jezebel was seeking his life. Not they. It wasn't the children of Israel were after Elijah. They were on his side after that whole event. I mean, they said the Lord's the God, right? We have no evidence from Scripture that we can see of anyone else going. I mean, Ahab didn't even go after him. He listened to him. Okay, well, I'm going home. He told you, know, he killed the prophets. I'm not going to do anything about it. He told me to go home because the rain's coming. Okay, I'll go home. We were, you know, like, he just went along and did whatever. Right. Ah Ahab wasn't after him. It was Jezebel that was after him. Right. So he had built up in his mind something that wasn't really accurate. Right. He was feeling the whole world coming down against him. But his he was perceiving things wrong. And again, this is another problem when, when we get into this, this depression and we, and we start thinking about things and we overanalyze and we, and we, and we kind of start conflating things and think things are too big and, and, and start perceiving problems that aren't really there, aren't really as bad as you think they are. And we need to remember that again with this depression because he was, you know, he's, Goes back to just saying, well, everything's going wrong. Your altars, you know, everyone's against you. Nobody's serving you, God. And, and they seek my life. I mean, everybody's after me now. That's the point he got to. But that wasn't really accurate. I said, 
So a lot of those things had happened, but I mean, things were turning. They're starting to go in the right direction because of that great event, because of the miracle that happened with the, with the altar. And it was one person. One person got to him. It was the straw that broke the camel's back, I think, for Elijah. But we need to try to, the best that we can, not get sucked into this perception and remember that, you know, one, even if they were seeking his life, God's with them and he's been with them the whole time and God's proved himself to them and, you know, he, he should be able to have that faith. But also to look at it from a standpoint and, be, and, and try to, to come to his senses and say, yeah, you know, there actually is a lot of good going on right now. And I did hear from some people, and, you know, and there's, there's, there's more going forward. So, um, again, everybody can, I, I, you know, I was depressed at one point in my life when I was younger. I was in my, right before I got saved, actually. I went through a really, really bad bout of, of having those types of things. I know what it's like to feel like the whole world's against you and not find any meaning in stuff and, uh, and you know, to deal with that type of thing. But, um, you know, as individuals, try to keep this story in mind to keep your, your outlook balanced and correct and, and looking at things without inflating them more than they need to be. And then as others that, that have people going through a situation, we need to remember all this stuff too and that the outward appearance of someone, oh, I'm fine. No, everything's good. And those comments might not actually be the truth and they're, you know, they actually need a little bit more help. So um, very good examples that, that, you know, of, of this type of mindset that we could learn from this. Now, um, what was that? One last thing I wanted to say about that. I don't know. It'll come to me in a minute. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 11. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. What's interesting about this is the, the, what, what I've heard people say in the past. I've gone out soul winning and you talk to people and everyone's got their own, you know, unique experiences, life experiences, things like that. And especially when it comes to their, their own experience with God. And I've actually had people tell me that they heard God speak to them. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Because I usually like to say, like, well, is God audibly speaking to you? And I've had a few people say, yeah. And it was a still, small voice. I've had it, it was more than once. I've had more than one people say that. And, and, and they're getting it from this passage right here, right? And oftentimes what they mean is they think that they're, they're thinking things in their head and they're making it be like this still small voice. I think some people want so bad to hear from God that they'll, they'll just think that it must be God speaking to me when you're having thoughts. But um, What's interesting is that of, of the people that have told me they've heard this still small voice, no one's ever mentioned the earthquakes or the wind or the, the fire, right? The, you know, I mean, there's this great event that happens because when God is speaking to Elijah here, that's what happens when God's presence actually comes to where Elijah is. And when God's presence is felt anywhere, it's never done in just like a whisper, right? Just the still small voice. God's presence is always known. People are always, you know, this great light shining from heaven when Jesus was talking to, to the Apostle Paul on the way, right, to Damascus. And everyone else fell down as dead because there's these thunderings and lightnings and stuff and he's, you know, Elijah's standing here and it says, Behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind rent the mountains. That means the mountains started breaking because the wind is rushing so hard and so fast that the mountains are literally starting to break. It says, And break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after wind, an earthquake, right? I mean, the whole earth is shaking at the presence of the Lord. And it says, and The Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. 
God is powerful, and when, his presen when he has his presence there, his presence is known without a doubt. This is the Lord talking to you. So, and I don't think anyone here will, but don't be deceived by the people who try to tell you, oh yeah, God was speaking to me audibly, and I heard his voice. I actually kind of worry about people who say they're hearing voices because God has revealed his word unto man and has completed that. He's successfully given us his word. Now, in times past, if someone was saying that, you test the words, right? Because God did audibly. He audibly spoke with Elijah right here. It happened. But people want to, to make them like, the, like Elijah, right? And this was actually the last, the, the thing that I wanted to bring up about the depression and about having this, this frame of mind and it's extremely important. Actually, I'm glad I didn't forget it. Was, um, people have this, this mentality of wanting to be really important. And everybody, you know, uh, so many, so many non-believers say, well, why doesn't God show me that he's real? I, mean, I can't tell you how many times people say, well, well, I want to see evidence. I want to see proof. I want something to happen in my life that God is showing me that he's real. And it's an interesting uh, outlook, but as much as we know that we are important in God's eyes according to Scripture, and we know that all the hairs of our heads are numbered, and we are extremely important, we have a lot of value to God, He never promises to make Himself just known to everyone and that He's just going to do whatever you say that you need in order to believe from him. Just like when the people were mocking Jesus, say, well, you know what? If you come down from that cross right now, I'll believe you. It's the same type of an attitude. People just, I just need you to show me something and then I'll believe you. But you know what? The people have that attitude, they probably won't believe. Because if Jesus came down from that cross, they still wouldn't believe. I guarantee you that those people who are saying, you come down from that cross and we'll believe you, didn't believe when he rose again from the dead. They didn't believe when the tomb was empty. So it doesn't matter. Just like the, in, uh, in Luke with the, the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man's in hell saying, you know, look, send Lazarus back to my household and tell my brothers, like, I don't want them coming to this place of torment. He says, they got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. That was Abraham's response. He says, no, but if someone came back from the dead, they'll listen. He said, if they're not going to hear the prophets... They're not going to believe though one comes back from the dead. That's what he said. And it's unfortunate. There's a lot of people out there that have this mindset of just thinking, well, I need to see something. God needs to make himself known in this particular way that I'm defining right now or else I'm not going to believe in him. And the way that this ties in with the depression is, is, that, is this, is the, and it's slightly different, but still important. When you start to, to catch yourself getting into these depressed states of mind, the number one reason for that and the problem for that is that you're focused on yourself. That's the problem. You start focusing on yourself and on all your problems and all the things that aren't going right in your life and all the things I don't have and how horrible everything is for me and it turns into me, 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 me where I start getting really sad, really depressed and it gets even worse and worse and worse. Elijah, even in this video, everyone's against me. No one's worshiping the Lord. Everything, why is everything going bad for me? Now they want to kill me. Me, 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 me. The solution to that is so simple. Start thinking about other people. When people in church start having depression thoughts, I, I just, you know what? Come out soul winning with me. Don't go out by yourself. Come out soul winning with me. We'll have some fellowship. We'll get some people saved. You're going to see when, when you start focusing on their problems, helping them out, leading an unbeliever to Christ, and changing their fate and their eternity of being damned to hell forever, going, getting saved and going to heaven. You know what? That's going to put you in a better mood. You're going to stop thinking about all of your own problems and how depressed you are when you start focusing on other people. 
And that's only one example. It doesn't even have to just be sewing. Sewing, I think, is the best thing to do. But you can go out and start going to nursing homes. Start going to places where people are really down and out. Why don't you start visiting people in other areas and seeing how can I be a blessing to someone else? That will help get you out of your depression way more than any drug is going to do for you. Way more than even just talking to someone is going to do. Help other people and think about them. You'll stop focusing on your own problems so much and you will feel way better. And the depression will go away. It works. I guarantee you that will work. It's the wrong mindset. And it, we saw that with Elijah thinking, you know, he started almost not making things up, but building it up to be more than it was. And he went through a lot. Don't get me wrong. You know, I don't want to, you know, just, just downplay everything that Elijah went through because he went through a lot. But every individual that starts getting depressed goes, you know, at least in their mind, they're going through a lot. There's pretty serious stuff. And again, I'm not going to downplay what happens in your personal life. Because I'm sure it's important. But get the right focus back. Focusing on other people is, is you, the more you focus on yourself, the more you're going to find problems. You, I mean, you're going to realize I'm not perfect. I got all those other things going on. What, you know, don't focus on yourself. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 13, 1 Kings 19. We're almost done. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel hath forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. So He's asked twice, you know, and, and it's the same exact answer both times. So he's asked the first time, and he, he gives an answer, and he says, okay, go stand upon the mount before the Lord. And he doesn't go all the way up upon the mount. He goes out to the entering into the cave after, all the, after God come, you know, passes by. So then he just goes out to entering into the cave, and then the voice comes again and says, you know, what are you doing here? And he gives the same exact answer. And then verse 15, it says, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So God's basically telling Elijah here, you know, don't worry, because a lot of the things that he's worried about, you know, is, is that there's people after him to kill him and everything else. Then don't worry, because Ahab's no longer going to be the king. You're going to anoint this person king over Syria, you're going to appoint this person king over Israel, and then you're going to appoint Elisha to be um, in your place, basically, in your room. He's going to be a prophet. He's going to be the next prophet that I have. And, um, but he's also telling them he's got more work for him to do. These are things I want you to do, it, Elijah. Right? You don't have to worry. I'm with you, but I've got more work for you to do. And again, this could help him to focus on doing the work God has for him instead of focusing on the problems he's having. God's saying, look, go out and do this. Now, the, other, the last interesting thing, though, is in, um, I hadn't noticed this before either. I thought about it during my studies for the sermon. He didn't complete all of his tasks. All he did was, was find Elisha. And I think he was most concerned just about finding the prophet that was going to come after him more than what happened with the kings. And the reason why I say that he didn't complete his task is because Elisha's the one that anoints Jehu king. And that's found in 2 Kings chapter 9. You turn there if you'd like. I'm going to read it for you. 2 Kings chapter 9 verse 1 says, And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. Then take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. Elisha sent to have that done. Elijah didn't. 
Same thing with uh, Hazael. Elisha has Jehu anointed, and he also tells Hazael that he'll be king. Hazael was sent from Ben-Hadad when Ben-Hadad was sick. And he says, go see the prophet and see if I'm going to recover from this. And he goes to Elisha, and Elisha tells him, and that's where he gets kind of sad, and he's saying, like, what? What's the big deal? And he says, I know what you're going to do. And Hazael is like, what? Do you think thy servant's a dog? And he's like, I know what you're going to do, and you're going to be king. So Elisha was the one that tells Hazael he's going to be king. Elisha is the one that anoints Jehu to be king. Elijah didn't do it. See, it's almost like he was kind of given up. Now, he wasn't done. There's still a couple more things. He still calls fire down from heaven and the, the people that, you know, again, he's sitting down on top of a mountain and, and the king sends for him and he's calling fire down from heaven upon him and, and God answers him and, and, call, and sends a fire down. But, I mean, from this point forward, it's not the same Elijah that we've seen in these other stories. So, um, still, I mean, obviously an awesome man of God. I love Elijah. I think, I think he did so many wonderful things. And God, had, God, God loved him enough. He took him to heaven. He didn't even die. Right. Took him to heaven in a whirlwind. I mean, that's, that's the way that he, he took him, just like Enoch. I mean, God, God loved Elijah for sure. But it makes me wonder, though, how history might have played out differently had those men been anointed earlier, if Elijah would have done it. Don't know. No way of knowing. But we know that after this is when uh, Ahab kills Naboth. Naboth didn't do anything wrong. I wonder if, if had Elijah anointed Jehu, maybe Ahab would have died sooner and, and not killed Naboth. Don't know. I mean, who knows, right? I, it's, all, it's all conjecture at this point. Who knows how anything would have played out? But definitely could have, would have had, definitely would have had an impact on the history and the way things played out had he done what the Lord had for him to do. See, God's going to make things happen one way or another. He used Elisha then instead of Elijah to do what he wanted to have done. But Elijah missed out on that. Uh, last, uh, finishing up here, verse number 17. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. And I think that's kind of interesting too because Elisha's a prophet and God's just saying, you know what? Anyone who Hazael doesn't kill, Jehu's going to kill. As far as doing the, the work of the Lord of just people who need to die, the wicked people. And he said, and whoever Jehu misses, Elisha's going to do it. Elisha's going to take care of it. And just a little bit, I mean, I've gone over this many times before, how men of God are painted in the world compared to in the Bible. Big difference there. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. It's always important to remember that we're not alone, and God is telling this to Elijah for the mere fact that he knows that Elijah is depressed. And he's telling him, look, Elijah, there's still 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to Baal. They're there. You're not alone. It's not just you. So get up and do this work because there are more people with you than you even realize. And, and he tells them this to, to get strength from that knowledge, just from knowing that. And uh, when, you're, you know, when you're at home, you know, I went over all that stuff before. This is, I kind of jumped ahead. But um, this is one of the reasons why coming to church is so important, knowing that you're not alone knowing that there's, there's other people out there. Let's finish up here. Verse number 19, we'll finish off the chapter. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. So he does go out and find Elisha. That's what he's doing here. And Elisha, this is a whole sermon in and of itself, which I don't have time to preach tonight because we're going already way over time. But... Um, Look at how hard of a worker Elisha was. He's plowing with 12 oxen and he's with the 12, like he's in there literally like with the oxen doing the work. He's using his strength along with the strength of the oxen to push and do this work. And this is someone who God has ordained and commanded that he's going to be the prophet. He sees what a hard worker he is. God's looking for hard workers. You want to do great things for God? Be a hard worker in your personal life. Even if it's not, you know, like whatever it is that you're doing, be a hard worker. When you're at your job, be a hard worker. 
Be diligent. Don't be lazy. Be diligent in the things, you know, if, if you're responsible in that which is least, you know, God will give you the greater riches. God will, will, will use you to do greater things. We know there's nothing greater than serving God in general. I mean, just with whatever we're doing, those are the best things we could be doing. And God will commit more to your trust when he sees, hey, he's being responsible and being a hard worker and things that don't even really matter that much. This is the guy that I want to be doing the things that really matter. I mean, your, your employer should see the same thing. You're a hard worker at the smallest tasks, at the jobs that no one likes to do, that the jobs that everyone grumbles about and complains about, but you're doing them and you're doing them diligently, and you're doing a hard work. Guess what? You're going to get promoted. Simple as that. Verse number 20, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Look at his zeal. I mean, he let, right away, he passes the mantle to him. He's like, oh man, it's Elijah. Runs out to him, just leaves the oxen there and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him. Now look at this, because this is where Elisha basically just kind of ends up burning his bridges and just saying, I'm going all in and serving the Lord because it says he took a yoke of oxen that he, you know, he was, he was plowing with his yoke with, with this oxen, with the, with the 12. He takes a yoke, he takes two of them and he, sl he slew them and it says he boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. So those very instruments, the tools he was using, the plow and everything else, he just burned that up Offer this, this meal, you know, give that to the, to the people, to his, to his mother, his father, let them eat. And he rose, went after Elijah, and look at this, it says, and ministered unto him. Elisha is a great man of God. He got a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And you read all the stories that Elisha did, but you know where he started out? He started off ministering. He started off being the servant to Elijah, being in his shadow, being his helper. A lot of things going on in this chapter. I think the number one thing that we see is the depression of Elijah and, and how we could use, you know, look at all the details, look at all the signs, look at all the symptoms and learn how to deal with that and how to help other people going through these same problems. It's so important. It's so important. I mean, so many bad things happen when people get too far down this, the, the downward progression of, of being depressed in their mind. And there's so much more that you could be doing in life than, than being depressed. And then the number one thing to take away from this, when you ever have that experience, that we're all susceptible to it. If you go through these problems, start thinking about other people. Do, do something to be a benefit to other people. There is no greater good than that. I mean, you're, you're gonna, you're, there's no better feeling and joy you're going to feel than doing something for others and just thinking about other people more. That's going to help you out. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, all the wisdom that we could find in your word, dear Lord. We pray for your guidance and instruction, God. I pray that, that um, whether or not there are people here that, that are struggling with being depressed, dear Lord, I pray that you would please just uh, help them and comfort them, dear God. Pro provide comfort through your Holy Spirit. Uh, first and foremost, dear Lord, help us to, to remember and to know that you're always there for us and that you will always be there for us. We don't always understand the journeys that we do go through and the trials that we have. And, and even if, if sometimes it may seem like you're not there, dear Lord, we could have confidence and faith that you really are and that, that whatever it is that we might be going through will, will ultimately end, end up being for our benefit, dear God. And we pray that you would please just lead us and guide us. Help us to identify other people who might be having problems and struggling, that we can be a, a great help unto them and that we can lift some spirits, dear Lord, and, and be a source of edification for others, that we can all be uh, joined together and knit together as a, as a church family here and, um, and that you can just use us to do mighty things to bring honor and glory unto your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.